Um, so last time we talked about um, social capital. Um, I'm just going to highlight some points that we made and, uh, and I'm not intending to uh, cover every point that we talked about the last time. So in that sense, I'm just going to um, select a couple of important points. We talked about social capital and within Europe, only Britain, we said, you know, um, um, United States and United Kingdom um, um, have shown a pattern that resemble each other, uh, marking a decline in, in interpersonal trust. That's what we said last time, uh, as you can remember. So the populations of both countries. Um, so one explanation for the reason that the interpersonal trust between um, the citizens and po uh, political system or politics in general and, and reflecting uh, to the political participation could maybe f uh, be found in the fact that both uh, countries are heavy viewers of television, um, which is a behavior that reduces social contact and, and communication, not only among citizens, but also uh, towards uh, political participation. Uh, we also said that um, uh, nor the, do the connections between social and political trust seem, seem to be strong. Um, so, however, studies show a weak correlation between trust in people and trust in government uh, are, are, are so small that they can be ignored. So, uh, in another way, the correlation between trust in people and the trust in government does not really hold up from a scientific perspective um, and um, certainly declining faith in government is an important trend in the democratic world uh, which we um, obviously did touch upon during our lectures um, and from my point of view from uh, from the netherlands from western europe we can definitely say that there are some countries uh, where political participation has been has been uh, quite quite weak, um, and probably uh, one indicator could be uh, the dissatisfaction uh, of the citizens. I mean, uh, if you look at uh, the way uh, how uh, Trump um, um, constructs his propaganda, he has this slogan uh, which is uh, "Make America Great Again." Um, you know, um, highlighting the fact that his voters are people who are dissatisfied and actually are um, disappointed and have some certain expectations which are not met by uh, politicians before Trump. So in that sense, um, social trust um, somehow is related to political participation and with it the social capital appearing uh, to be uh, to be strongly um, related to it. So uh, we also talked about post-materialism as a concept uh, which is which is important uh, for uh, for exam in the future um, and you could um, you know the author has described it as a silent revolution um, you know as contrary to revolutions being uh, a shocking incident, uh, which could be, uh, you know, dynamic, um, vitally strong, um, violent um, actions on streets. But post-materialism being entitled as a silent revolution actually um, is uh, is something uh, which was which was written about by Engelhardt, and according to Engelhardt, this is. Uh, a unique combination of affluence, peace and security uh, from the 1970s on in the last century leading to a silent revolution in Western political cultures. He actually argues that the emphasis on economic achievement as the main priority is making way for an emphasis on the quality of life. Um, so from the 1960s, a new generation, according to Engelhardt, are, uh, could be called as post-materialists um, um, uh, instead of being materialist actually beyond being uh, materialistic. Uh, you know, especially uh, during the 60s and 70s, young, well-educated people with uh, concerns centered on lifestyle uh, issues such as ecology, nuclear disarmament and feminism. Um, you know, 
especially the pre-war generations, um, contrasting to the pre-war generations who valued order, security, and fixed rules being more conservatives in such areas as religion, uh, sexual morality, post-materialists take political and religious authority for granted. They give priority so to self-expression and flexible rules. Um, Post-materialists are elite challenging advocates of the new politics rather than uh, elite sustaining foot soldiers in the old party battles. So in a way, Engelhardt uh, separates uh, an era of uh, pre-war generation uh, and actually that generation experience, having experienced the war and the next generation who have not experienced the war and grew up in affluence and in, in uh, quite welfare high uh, living standards which actually created a culture of post-materialism and that being a silent revolution um, and people uh, valuing not uh, ma material uh, properties attributes but intrinsic um, uh, very um, very actually deep-rooted uh, cultural uh, values such as ecology um, uh, global warming um, economy injustice justice equality and freedom such as the freedom of speech uh, and other liberal values so we talked about this and um, we also gave a definite definition um, and according to this definition, post-materialism is actually a commitment to radical uh, quality of life. So we could summarize all these values as the quality, increasing the quality of life, which is an argument I frequently hear uh, living in the Netherlands. And when a patient gets ill or sick, uh, there is always there are always two options: can we save the patient, and if we can can save the patient. Uh, would that would that obstruct the quality of life? So the quality of life in uh, most facets of life is something that keeps on coming back in a post-materialist uh, society. I can definitely um, um, uh, vouch that the Dutch uh, culture would be one which is post-materialistic, and especially during the 70s and 80s, I remember as a child that these were uh, serious issues and I find these elements in my own personal life as well. So uh, quality of life issues such as the environment which can emerge especially among the educated young uh, from a foundation of personal security and material affluence. Uh, so it is, um, it is it is characteristic to being post in order to be able to uh, to be a post materialist uh, these people uh, actually characteristically uh, grew up in a society that was wealthy so it was affluent uh, there were no shortages of food uh, health or uh, um, uh, or material um, um, uh, contributions to their personal lives um, making them seek out um, 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 the quality of life actually so the question is actually uh, building on you know you have the material everything the house the car uh, the money the salary the position so how can you further on increase the quality of life in terms of maybe uh, art um, or um, or spirituality i'm not saying religion so spirituality is defined as something else as as religion so uh, post-materialists participate extensively in politics, but they are inclined to join elite challenging promotional groups rather than traditional political parties. So I do also recognize that part. So you could, you could uh, argue that uh, post-materialists do kind of shop uh, instead of becoming a member, solid fixed member of one established political party, you see actually a big change within the political environment and people uh, shopping from uh, the party programs of various political parties. Uh, in that sense, um, so Europe, um, post-materialism came first to and made deepest inroads in the wealthiest democracies such as Denmark, the Netherlands and West Germany. Uh, the affluent Scandinavian countries, except Norway, also proved receptive, receptive to these values. 
post-materialism remains less common in poor democracies with lower levels of education. As I said, you know, there are big differences within uh, European countries, Eastern European countries and Western European countries. So the, that generation actually built that culture on affluence, on, um, um, on, on wealth, actually. Um, and um, Engelhardt actually um, makes a prediction, uh, which is that in the future, as long as um, de democratic capitalist countries provided that they can grant the wealth um, and um, um, the, the material foundations, uh, post-materialist values will increase. And it actually did happen in the 70s, 80s and 90s, post-materialist generations increased and it became actually national values, national culture for these Western countries. Um, Let's take a look at the next slide. Um, moving on. So we also talked about political culture. Uh, I see a typo in the heading, political cultural in new democracies, it says, but it's supposed to be political culture in new democracies. Um, you know, there's uh, obviously big difference between new democracies and established democracies. We did talk about the uh, the Industrial Revolution, 1750 and 1789, the French Revolution, and the long run of success of established democracies, uh, establishing a political culture, a system. For some countries, it meant uh, presidential uh, system, political uh, systems. For th some countries, uh, par parliamentary uh, democratic systems, such as in the United Kingdom versus the United States. So, um, you know, uh, political culture, actually, we said last week that it comes from uh, from a historical perspective. Um, we did talk about, um, uh, you know, countries such as Italy and Spain and how authoritarian rule um, uh, did uh, disturb uh, an established uh, democratic political culture. Uh, so in that sense, um, uh, Spain uh, would be one uh, that actually uh, did uh, was influenced by the economic performance as well as the political uh, performance, such as the authority and rule of General Franco. Um, moving on, I'm just I'm just looking uh, what we should um, talk about everything because I have to keep in mind that we have a limited amount of time. Um, so yeah, well actually that was our last uh, last slide from the last from last week. So uh, for this week um, we will be starting to uh, the book, um, which is also edited by Joseph Nye and understanding the book is called Understanding Conflict and Cooperation. I will obviously make sure that you get uh, the parts uh, for reading and you can go through uh, that those parts that we will be studying uh, at your own leisure uh, that you will receive those. So Nye teaches us in uh, his book, um, um, Understanding Conflict and Cooperation, he, he tells us that, that there is a conceptual toolkit. What he means by a conceptual toolkit is that Every discipline has specialized vocabulary, concepts and vocabulary uh, that are used and that are highly specialized and they are defined in a way that people uh, who study these disciplines can communicate with each other uh, through publishing uh, articles and books. So uh, he says this is, this is quite important. So that's, that's the first note that he makes. Uh, highly specialized vocabularies must be well defined in order to understand theory and the history historical perspective when we look into international relations. As you can recall, um, the, uh, the module, this uh, course is called um, uh, uh, Conflict, conflict uh, Ideas, Ideologies and Identities. So in that sense, uh, we will be uh, slowly diving into the uh, introductory introductory uh, conceptual toolkits and Joseph Knight does a very very good job so uh, you know along the uh, this thought of uh, you know line of thought he gives us some concepts he says uh, 
as examples for these uh, conceptual toolkits. He says states, nations, and when you combine state and nation, uh, we talk about nation states. So we have to define these these uh, these concepts in our vocabulary. And he says perhaps the single most important concept used in the study of world politics is the sovereign state. Unfor unfortunately, it is also one of the most confusing, partly because it is two concepts bundled together, sovereignty and state. So let's introduce two, two more uh, concepts, uh, the realism and liberalism. So for realists, um, they would insist that states are the only significant actors just, just to, to bring you that distinction um, uh, between realism and liberalism in relation to world politics and world politics um, talking about the actors such as states, nations and nation states, just to make that distinction. So um, for liberals, uh, they would argue that states are not the only most important among, you know, it would not the only actor that is is important but there would be it would be one of the many important actors so for realist realism it's actually quite easy um, you know uh, the explanation we can you know realists believe that uh, when we think uh, from the perspective of the actor state it can uh, uh, explain uh, many of the uh, many of the problems or uh, issues that that we could you know throw at realism, and it would argue that it it is able to um, explain from the perspective of uh, of the most important actor, which is which is the state. So liberals argue that it's not the only one, uh, but there are many others. So once uh, Nye has taken us through the this introductory point, uh, a state. Uh, is he says that a state is a particular type of political unit that has two crucial characteristics. So, uh, in order to be able to talk about a state, uh, we have to consider territoriality and sovereignty. Territoriality is straightforward. A state governs a specific, identifiable portion of the Earth, Earth's surface, right? Sovereignty is the absolute right to govern it. So we talked about the monarchies and the kings and the queens in the past, uh, the 15th century, the 16th century, um, where uh, these individuals are sovereign and enjoy supreme authority over the territories they govern, right? That's what we talked about. So in democracies, so once we make the step from um, um, into the de democratic political system, uh, it's not the individual who's sovereign, but the people hold sovereignty, actually. So it's not, you, you would think, um, well, it's just a, a mindset. The people hold within democracies sovereignty, uh, and by way of elections, competitive elections, as Schumpeter says, um, uh, they delegate, the people delegate government to their elected uh, representatives and other state officials, right? But whatever the ultimate source of sovereignty, all states uh, have governments that pass laws and force order and are supposed to defend the people who live within their borders. So in that sense, we have defined the parameters of what we would call a state. So territoriality and sovereignty um, and the difference between an individual and the people. So you see the movement passing, shifting of sovereignty, legitimacy from one individual to the people who elect their own um, governors. So the confusion, you know, as you can recall, I just said that um, uh, Nye also talks about that the word state is a bit of is a bit confusing. So the confusion, he says, are at three points. The first point uh, would be by state, um, we don't mean country. By a state, we don't mean federal territories, territories such as in the United States, United States. So um, uh, we, we're not talking about fe federal um, states that are united um, in one country. Uh, so not, it's not that kind of state. The, by state, it's not also um, 
we don't also we don't either uh, mean a government. So United States, when you when you would think of United States, you would uh, you know you would hear uh, the terminology. It's a weak state. By this, we don't mean that the United States is a is a is a weak, powerless state, but it's it it's decentralized. Decentralization means that there uh, that uh, the uh, the United States within its uh, within its uh, political construction has decided to build in checks and balances. So power is not focused uh, in on one level to attain to one individual or to the council or uh, to the chamber, to the senate, um, or uh, you know the uh, uh, the law is is not um, uh, solely uh, uh, all powerful, but uh, you know there there are checks and balances, politics, judiciary, and executive. Uh, all these different elements they keep each other uh, in in check. Uh, for example, Singapore um, could be uh, titled as a strong state, meaning that uh, that it's quite centralized. The power is centralized. So according to Nye. Uh, in this, uh, this is this, uh, context. Context is key. So let's remember what we mean by the word context. Context is like the coordinates. When you talk about uh, social context or context, you mean um, that there is a location, uh, that there is, um, um, you know, a, 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 a geography, uh, maybe a timeline, a time period, um, and uh, it has a target group, uh, people. Uh, who live in that on that land in in a specific time period? So there's a proximity, and that's what we mean by context. So it's very contextual what we're talking about when you talk about a weak state or a strong state. In this in this case, a weak state is one which is decentralized, uh, but the United States is absolutely not a weak state on, in, uh, on a literal literal sense. It's 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 a superpower, right? Uh, and, a, and a strong state, that's what we mean when uh, a state has uh, centralized its, its um, uh, political power. So uh, moving on to the word concept nation, another word often used as a synonym for state is nation. This is a particularly unfortunate practice, according to Nye, because the word nation is commonly used to denote a group of people who have some combination of common language, culture, religion, history, mythology, identity, or sense of destiny. Um, so in that sense, national groups uh, within states often claim a right to self-government. So imagine a state, imagine a country uh, where you have different national groups. Uh, groups who have a common a culture, uh, maybe different religion, uh, different history, maybe a different language. Um, and um, it could it, it could be uh, evident that these national groups could claim a right to self-government or self-determination, which is also uh, self-determination. Self-determination uh, is the ability to decide one's own political fate. Uh, this frequently includes a claim to a state of one's own. So you see there is a difference between a nation and the concept state. So we said, you know, for, for in order to be able to be a state, uh, it's territoriality and sovereignty. And when we're talking about a nation, we're talking actually about national groups who share common language, culture, religion, history, mythology, or identity. Um, and they could have a claim on being a state. So in that sense, uh, once that happens, you talk about a nation state. And uh, remember that uh, for um, uh, realists, uh, the state is the only actor. So we're going to make that um, a leap in a couple of uh, couple of minutes. For the sake of clarity, says Nye, it is always important to pay careful attention to what people actually mean when they use terms such as state, nation, and nation state. You will find them being used interchangeably, but we political scientists, we should understand uh, what these uh, concepts in our toolkit mean. It does not help that the world's preeminent organization of sovereign states called the United Nations, or that we call what happens between states international politics. So in that sense, it's important to, uh, 
to not to exchange these words with each other as a political scientist, as a person who studies uh, uh, world politics. Uh, uh, just, just a checklist. Uh, uh, Nye gives us five factors. To be a state, one must be recognized, obviously, as a state by other states. In this sense, being a state um, is a bit like being a member of a world club. Existing members must admit you as a state. So what are these five factors? One, whether there is a government with de facto control over a certain territory. So it's about territoriality. Second, whether other states claim the territory, and if so, how strong their claim is. Is there any dispute uh, among national groups who claim the same territory? Um, well, there are many examples of this kind. And what happens when there is a conflict between uh, such claims between national groups, uh, it could lead to conflict. Hence, uh, we study uh, conflict and cooperation. Three, um, in order to be able to talk uh, of a state, uh, whether uh, a third point would be whether the people seeking to establish a new state are historically oppressed. So this is an interesting point because um, uh, it does make it does make a point. It does. It is valid if there is a historical claim, historical oppression, historical conflict um, taking place, um, which relates the national group to the to the uh, territory. So, in order to have that new state, uh, you could look uh, look at, for example, the uh, the, the uh, example of of Palestine and Israel. So, this is an interesting point from a historical. Uh, point of view uh, on oppression. So uh, both groups could say, well, in the past, my nation was oppressed and I had to move out. And the other one could say, well, right now I am oppressed and um, I, uh, my people are moving out or moving in. Uh, so in order to be able to talk of a nation, the fourth point would be whether those people consider their government legitimate. So is there legitimacy uh, uh, by, the, by the people in uh, in the state, and the four and the fifth point would be whether recognizing the new state as sovereign uh, would affect their own claims and interests. So we do talk about when we talk about nation states, we also talk about their national claims and interests, right? So there are uh, interest, domestic interests, as well as international uh, interests in the immediate surrounding, as well as. Uh, maybe um, not immediate surroundings on the periphery, um, uh, on, 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 on a farther uh, distance. But anyhow, uh, does the new state have claims and interests? And they should. Um, you know, a, a couple of slides ago, we made the difference between two new um, uh, concepts uh, in our course. We talked about realists and liberals, right? Uh, so when you say Germany attacked Poland, now he makes this point, he argues, when you say Germany attacked Poland, actually it wouldn't be accurate. What would be accurate would be that you would say Germans attacked Pol Poles, not Germany attacked Poland, because Germany cannot attack, attack Poland. Uh, Germans, however, can attack Poland. Poles, and this what this is what we call anthropomorph uh, anthropomorphizing. It's a difficult word even for me. Uh, it means that you attribute human attributes to uh, to concepts, and sometimes that does cause uh, problems and confusion. And it would cause us to assume wrongly that these are unitary actors. Um, with interests, minds, and wills of their own. Well, um, to be honest, it's not Germany who has interests and mind and, and, and own will. Um, it's the individual, right? The individuals run the countries, the states. So when you, when you talk about a state, a state does not have an ideology or a will, a personal will. Uh, so it wouldn't be uh, honest to uh, make such an assumption. But we do, however, uh, from time to time, use these concepts in that way. So he's, what, what Nye actually says is that uh, quite often what happens in the world can only be understood if we pay attention to the disagreements, debates, and sometimes even struggles 
that take place inside states. Uh, for example, he gives the uh, example of Kennedy and Khrushchev, um, uh, who cut an abrupt deal to end the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, very famous, uh, because both had become frightened of the unanticipated, uh, inadvertent, and sometimes insubordinate actions of their own militaries. Um, I mean, you have the president, you have the person who's elected uh, in office, uh, but on the other side, the uh, president doesn't act alone to run the state, right? Uh, the leader uh, who's elected does not uh, have the, f even though he has full um, responsibility, he works together with other people, and there are different dimensions to the state, and one of them would be military, the other one would be bureaucracy, the other one, the other one would be uh, economy, um, etc., etc., or the judicial uh, dimension. So all these individuals running these departments and dimensions do have their own personal instincts. So uh, um, there is also that dilemma. And uh, this is a very good example uh, for both Kennedy and Khrushchev, who were actually afraid that um, the overzealous um, military leaders or the individual who sits behind the button of a nuclear uh, uh, arsenal uh, uh, you know, rocket could push just the button. So how do you prevent that? So that is very, very interesting because neither of the uh, the, the state leaders were interested in uh, running a war. So uh, he just makes it very interesting on, on how, uh, uh, you know, what the level of analysis would be to look at. Um, so um, agents, and then uh, Nye also talks about agents. Um, uh, so agents of the state, the soldiers, the diplomats, and the bureaucrats are only uh, only ever supposed to act in accordance with superior's instructions, right? That's what we just talked about in a previous example. Uh, and they um, are behaving inappropriate, inappropriately as actors. So for realists, uh, when they explain um, positions, um, they explain it from the perspective of the actor and not the agent. Um, so liberals also agree with the realists that the actor is a very important, um, 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 uh, that the state is a very important actor uh, in, in, in explaining such political processes. Uh, but we should make the difference between actors, um, you know, um, the, the, the state, as an actor and agents who function under um, under the uh, the state as an actor, but we can also look from the point of view of individual human beings, uh, multinational corporations, and this is where liberals come in uh, with their argument. It's not only the state uh, that is an actor, but it's also the individual human being. It's also the multinational corporations. It's also the NGOs, the churches, the diasporas, uh, national groups, transnational criminal networks, uh, drug cartels, terrorist groups, or charitable foundations, ce even celebrities, movie actors, and any number of other types of actors can do things that have real consequences. So um, we cannot, liberals actually uh, criticize realists uh, for them just being um, very very simplistic. I mean, liberals say, well, you should also look at other actors, and realists would say, well, you know, uh, in terms of world politics, you should only look from the perspective of, of the state as an actor. Has it always been the case? Well, there is a big difference between classical realists and neo-realists, neo but we will get to that. So, both realists, as well as liberals, agree that states are important, for uh, uh, realists, it's more important than liberals. Um, uh, uh, and um, uh, the states are the most important actors. Uh, failed states have the capacity in principle to control the flow of people. So when we talk about states for both realists and liberals, uh, why the state is, is, is uh, significant. One, uh, while well, states have the capacity in principle to control the flow of people, goods and money, so it's a big organization uh, on on um, on a territoriality, 
be having sovereignty and once you have the sovereignty as a state you can control the flow of people goods and money across borders right and there are there are borders for the territoriality uh, and, and and no state uh, controls this perfectly so it's never perfect but most states control it fairly effectively and this is something uh, only a state can do right um, two uh, states normally are the only actors that wield significant armies so um, uh, if it's not a state but it has a small army it's not it's it wouldn't be um, something that we could accept as legitimate we could we wouldn't be able to say it has authority or legitimacy uh, in, in the international arena so it wouldn't be admitted uh, by other states it would be perceived as a threat think of the terrorist groups right so uh, no matter or the cartels or the mafia or the mob etc so it wouldn't be it wouldn't be considered as as legitimate or sovereign three only states have the power to tax and spend in significant amounts no uh, uh, no any other otherwise it wouldn't be um, um, it would be mafios right so only the state can collect taxes for only states promulgate and enforce laws so only states have constitutions and they can enforce laws upon their own citizens and there are there is no um, higher authority above states and you have states and beyond that there is actually nothing else there is no central authority that a state can call and say well hey i'm in difficulty could you please there is no 911 uh, to dial on an international arena so that's what we call the anarchic system so anarch anarchic system doesn't mean that there's anarchy it just means that there is no central authority that states could um, you know depend on so the states are on their own so that's what realists would say realism would say self-help states must be able to help themselves it's not other help uh, so that would be an ideal that one state thinks of another state but most states think of their own national interests and that's uh, what realists would argue um, versus liberals liberals would say well you know um, by doing trade obviously i think of myself but i also want them to buy my goods so there is this you know also national self beneficial interest um, just to make that separation so again now we did discuss about power uh, when we were studying organsky and uh, in that in that uh, sense um uh, you know from that point of view uh, we did talk about power and now also talks about power and power is the ability he says to achieve one's purposes or goals you know we did um, we also did talk about this organsky gave kind of the same definition uh, more specifically it is the ability to affect uh, others to get the outcomes one wants and robert robert dahl uh, a yale political scientist defines power as the ability to get others other nations or other states to do what they uh, otherwise would not do so this is important i'm going to read it again because Defi uh, he defines Dahl defines power as the ability to get others other states to do what they otherwise would not do but when we measure power in terms of the changed behavior of others we have to know their preferences right and what what, what does this uh, you know uh, sentence suggest it suggests actually that you know how would you know the preferences of other, of other states um, well you would obviously observe and you would communicate and you would have a presence in in some form to know that um, that you know the preferences of other states so um, the ability to influence others is usually associated with the possession of certain resources if you don't you know we talked with organsky and we talked about you know size of of, of the territory uh, we talked about resources various forms of resources but it was about the usage of these resources right so and also says you know you know the possession of certain resources political leaders commonly define power in terms of these resources including population we talked about this uh, territory natural resources economic size military forces military presence and political stability among others so 
it's it's kind of overlaps with uh, with uh, with literature, uh, 50, 60, maybe more years, and now um, uh, you know uh, making the same point in terms of power. So a state will prefer not to show. Uh, Nye also makes suggestions, and he says, well, states should not actually show, um, um, you know, their uh, their power level uh, to other states, and they should they should be in a in a position of bluffing in a creating an image of that they could do more um, than they can actually do. So this is just an argument. Um, states will mostly be rational, so it would be uh, it would be wise to be rational and to know what you, what what your own state can do and cannot do, and what other states would be able to do and what they wouldn't be able to do. Assessing that situation would be called the cost benefit ratio before taking any action uh, that could be detrimental for your own nation state. Sometimes there are unnecessary risks or mistakes. Remember, we call Iraq and uh, the general who was on television, uh, he, was, he was actually trying to convince uh, the Iraqis and the whole world population that nothing was happening, while at the same time uh, there were bombing bombs falling on that building, and uh, you, you, could, you could literally see the dust coming down from the ceiling. So, you know, um, sometimes, you, you know, uh, leaders do uh, make mistakes or they risk, uh, take risks which are very, very unnecessary. In this sense, it can be just as important to set the agenda and attract others in world politics as it is to force to change in particular situations. Uh, this aspect of power that is getting others to want what you want is called attract, attractive or soft power. So this is a new term that we're hearing in this course. Uh, soft power is uh, different than hard power. And soft power would be a, a, a convincing argument or idea, uh, an attractive way of setting the agenda <clears throat> in order to get um, the goals, the ambitions or the objectives that you're aiming to get other states um, do behave in a way that you actually would want. So there are nations uh, who are very small, like the Netherlands, but it's very, very effective in setting the agenda. So you would, you could say that the Netherlands, as a very, very small country, is quite elaborate, quite uh, nifty in setting the agenda um, in uh, within the European Union as well as. Uh, on a global level in terms of economic measures or having uh, or making trade. So, um, you know, versus hard power, which would be obviously um, a different approach. So, um, you know, uh, once we ask the question, what resources are the most important sources of power today? Uh, a look at the five uh, centuries since the birth of sovereign state states shows that different power resources played critical roles in different periods. The sources of power are never static and they continue to change in today's world. Moreover, they vary in different parts of the world. Soft power is becoming more important in relations among the post-industrial society. So what Nye actually says here is that uh, even though there is a difference between soft power and hard power, soft power is inherent or an attribute of established democracies. Those countries who have political culture, uh, a culture that is well-established, well-structured, and um, they can communicate uh, on, on a level that attracts benefits, mutual benefits, uh, re reciprocity. And he says that hard power uh, well, because there is this statement that democracies never actually uh, make war with other democracies, it says, well, it depends because, um, you know, you have no democracies and you have established democracies and you have democracies that, which are post-industrial, who are in the digital age, uh, 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 so, to, so to say, and those countries would uh, not prefer to make war, but instead would be preferably uh, being in a mutual trading um, um, beneficial beneficial relationship that benefits both sides 
and and uh, they would obviously use um, you know agenda setting uh, as as power uh, which which would be soft power um, versus hard power which would be characteristic for maybe um, countries that are not industrialized yet or in, or in the uh, competitive uh, way of constructing their industrial uh, industrial societies. So it, it depends on the part of the world and it depends on that historical perspective where the, uh, where the country uh, or the state finds itself in. Um, so, you know, um, just to get back to classical, classical realism and neorealism, Nye also, um, you know, rubs on, on, on neorealism and, and um, you know, neorealists such as Kenneth Waltz um, who would tend to be materialists who pay little attention to the role of ideas. So as I told you that, you know, liberals would argue, would critique realism or neorealism as not, not uh, paying much attention to uh, the soft side of power, or you could say ideas, ideologies, uh, arguments, claims, uh, arguments, um, and agenda setting, uh, but um, and 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 you know blaming actually uh, the realists as being parsimonious, and parsimonious would mean um, that um, that something simple explains a lot, something um, you know small one word two concepts like realists uh, believing that the uh, uh, the only most important significant actor being the state would explain a lot. So that's what we mean by parsimonious. Um, uh, versus liberals who would, who would uh, attain a lot of value to many different um, uh, actors in, in, in world politics. So, um, you know, uh, getting back to the difference between neorealists and classical realists, Nye says that classical realists such as Machiavelli and Morgenthau uh, did actually spend some, um, you know, thought on, um, on ideas as a source of power. So, it is actually the neorealists who have made this choice of, of um, you know, focusing on state as the only significant actor. Um, you know, international system being anarchic, I said something about that, meaning that there are no central authorities that has complete sovereignty and legitimacy. And it would mean that states are actually self-help from, from a realistic, from a realism school of thought. Realists think it is social. Um, only in a thin, superficial sense, while liberals and constructivists think that social constraints, the social dimension of action, are much thicker, it's more important. So thin means um, superficial, not very important, and thick means being very important, significant. But virtually all both uh, agree that social dimensions of international politics promote orderly interaction. So. Um, liberals as well as constructivists agree with each other that um, uh, that there is anarchy there is anarchy your anarchism uh, the international order is anarchic meaning that there is no central authority but it does help uh, when states are communicating with each other and try to bring order and um, try to predict the behavior of other states who are equally strong or equally powerful and need to know the intentions, the information uh, of about other states, how they would how they would behave under certain circumstances. So realists say that states have little choice in defining their national interests. So for realists, there is no choice. You mean uh, it would be insignificant to even consider other options. So there is actually no not much of a choice. A state, a nation state, should think in terms of hard power um, and, and, and in terms of materialistic arguments about their national interests in the international order. They must define their interest in terms of power or they will not survive or you know the survival rate will diminish. Uh, just as a company in a perfect market that wants to be altruistic, helpful, uh, rather than maximizing profit, very hardcore, you know, capitalist, capitalistic view uh, will not survive. So if you're too altruistic, you're trying to help the other, other help instead of 
a self-help uh, you're, you're just you know you're making life uh, difficult for yourself in terms of, of um, surviving so for the realists a state's position in the international system determines its national interests and predicts its foreign policies uh, liberals and constructivists argue that national interests are defined by much more than the state's position in the international system so it's not only uh, the state's position that one should take a look uh, but they should also look at richer accounts uh, preferences and national interests uh, uh, formed by um, you know the domestic society so it's also the social fabric uh, of the society the internal domestic society and its culture um, that that defines a state's national interests for example a domestic society that values economic welfare and places heavy emphasis on trade uh, or that views uh, views wars against other democracies as legitimate defines its national interests very differently from a despotic state that is similarly positioned in the international system so liberals argue that this is particularly true if international institutions and channels of communication enable states to build trust so uh, just to make that you know contrast between um, um, realists and liberals realists for realism there is actually no other option than to think in terms of power otherwise uh, you're diminishing your chances um, of survival and you need those resources for your own benefit and you shouldn't share them for liberals uh, it it is it can be altruistic and it's even good to, to do trade so trade is better than you know making wars or scaring other states and and using hard power because uh states wouldn't uh, you know smaller weaker states would only comply up to an extent uh as long as there is hard power but they would never trust so the trust issue for liberals is very important building trust building um, um mutual good relationships between states is uh, is one way to escape the prisoner's dilemma and the prisoner's dilemma uh, always always um, 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 uh, gives you uh, the rational rational approach that the prisoners will uh, will blame each other um, and in that sense uh, trust is for liberals uh, an important way to escape the prisoner's dilemma um, so uh, another term that we should think about is structure uh, we use the term structure to describe the configuration of the units and process to capture their interactions what do we mean by that so the distinction between structure and process at any given time can be illustrated by the metaphor of a poker game uh, the structure of a poker game is in the distribution of power so when we talk about um, uh, realism we actually talk about structure and what realists mean by structure is how power is distributed in the material sense so basically uh, how is how is your what is your power level in terms of the metaphor poker game you could think how many chips do i have how many chips do you have if i have 100 chips and you only have three chips i mean i would take more risk and you wouldn't take any any risk or you would at least try to minimize your risk right from an, from a rational point of view so structure is about how is power distribute distributed between the actors and the process is how the game is being played what are the rules and what are the type of interactions and how do players interact with each other is there cheating going on and if cheating happens what what do we do how do we punish so that's the process and structure is about the way power is being distributed uh, should we just focus on structure or process or process i mean how about communication and language and ideas so um you know there is there is this tendency by realists to to focus on structure um, uh, whereas uh, liberals would also um, try to look at the process right or other agents or other uh, actors within the world politics in the field uh, for example allowing the players in prisoners dilemma game 
uh, to communicate with one another because according to the uh, axiom, uh, according to the rules within the prisoner's dilemma, uh, you know, the players are not allowed to talk e to each other. So um, they would um, um, uh, they would just blame each other, right? Um, that would be the most uh, you know basic explanation um, to uh, to not get you know the maximum amount of of uh, imprisonment. Um, but you know liberals would say, how about communication and language? What about the role? What if you introduce into the game communication uh, and language and ideas? Uh, it says, well, uh, it would it would actually change. The whole thing, the whole concept, because we actually look uh, quite black and white to prisoners' dilemma. Um, once, uh, once the players communicate with one another, it would alter the nature of the game. Uh, when states communicate with one another and reach mutually beneficial agreements or create well, well, uh, you know, uh, understand it, well understood norms and institutions, international institutions, they add to the repertoire of state strategies and then and can thus alter political outcomes, right? So language are uh, important. So language and usage of diplomacy uh, and um, um, interaction, uh, making that effective and efficient interaction does actually help a lot uh, from that perspective. So what makes a system, uh, international system stable? Uh, uh, the first point that Nine makes is that the social fabric of international society. Um, uh, let me see. I think that I'm just going to continue a, a couple more minutes, and then I will end it, uh, and then we will continue next week from uh, from this slide on. Just just to finish this slide. So according to Nye. Uh, the social fabric of international society is important. The stronger the normative and institutional threads binding states and the denser the connections between them, the greater the stake, uh, stake states have in preventing system breakdown and the more avenues they have available for resolving disagreements before they can get out of hand. The weaker the social context, the more the system resembles a Hobbesian state of nature. So introducing or taking the social fabric into account, the social political, the, the political culture, the social culture, the values and the norms of a society, uh, uh, that social dimension actually prevents us entering the Hobbesian um, state of nature, uh, which is actually quite self-help. Um, and the second point is that, that the technology, right, nuclear weapons uh, during the Cold War actually prevented, it actually prevented uh, to go into war um, and, and because, because nations were afraid that not only one nation but the other one um, would be destroyed as well. And uh, another one would be um, well, levels of analysis, I think I'm going to uh, stop here. Um, and um, I conducted this lecture on my own, um, and uh, so you can you can just watch the video, and I hope that uh, it will be beneficial for you. Um, and I want to thank you for listening to me. Um, and next time we see each other on Friday, we will continue from the levels of analysis. Thank you very much, and I wish you all a pleasant evening. Thank you. Bye bye.